Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 251. Rewriting. Rewriting. In this vlog series, the two most frequent requests for content that I receive are about reading and writing. And I'm working on a very complicated reading series for you right now. I'm a hundred plus articles and books in at the moment, so I'm not sure where that's going, but I'm shaping that up for you. But I did think it was timely once more to offer an intervention, a node for your thought, a node for you to think about, about writing. And I particularly wanted to acknowledge the remarkable book by Joseph Harris, Rewriting. How to do things with texts. <laughs> How to do things with texts. Now, Rewriting, this great book, is moving through its second edition, and I really do recommend it to you. It's a powerful argument, and it is a powerful word. Rewriting. So, today, I'm going to offer an argument for your consideration. And that argument is that all writing is actually rewriting. All writing is rewriting. And I receive a lot of requests from students. We're talking thousands of requests from students with a very seemingly simple question. How do we transform that which we read into an interpretation of what we have read. Seems a simple question is actually a very difficult process. So this vlog is about you, yes you, and how you write, but also how you rewrite. And I'd like us to play between those words today. Firstly, I do need to acknowledge the remarkable Roland Barthes. I read Roland Barthes when I was a very, very young person, 2021, and he, his writing about writing really did change my life. And if I'm to this day to list my 10 favourite books of all time, Camera Lucida is always in that list of 10. But I wanted to quote a little bit from the very famous work he's done on the death of the author. And Barthes stated that, quote, a text is made up of multiple writings, drawn from many cultures and entering into multiple relations of dialogue, parody and contestation. End of quote. Great quote. So, therefore, Bart shows to us the simplicity, if you will, when we separate out reading and writing. Actually, it's about contestation between the terms. So all writing that we do is a dialogue with that that we have read. Mm -hmm. So therefore, all writing is rewriting what we read. So therefore today I want to provide an entree into many of the requests about writing I receive. Big hello to Mike, big hello to Joanne. They asked me for some bespoke vlogs which I will deliver to you about interpretation and about analytical writing and they're great vlog requests. But I needed to go here first to address those concerns. And I think Harris's book provides for us all the title but also the argument for us to think about. And you can completely disagree with what I'm talking about today, but here's some ideas to think through and think about. The major academic question we never really ask in our lives is how do we as scholars use the words of others in our academic writing? Put another way, how do we work with the words of others in a way that organises, restructures and scaffolds our ideas to create originality. And I understand why we don't ask this, again, seemingly very simple question. And the answer is, we live in times where we have all these bogeymen around us. <coughs> and these bogeymen are, of course, plagiarism, BFA academic misconduct, research misconduct, and even, of course, 
self-plagiarism. So these words and phrases frighten us. They create an academic culture of fear and worry and confusion. But my argument is also that the academic misconduct, research misconduct, creates a research culture of conservatism that's fueled by the fear. How often, therefore, with all these fears and bogeymen around us, how often do we think robustly and honestly about the relationship between writing and rewriting? Now, I've always been a very proud academic. I'm a proud academic, proud to be an academic, and I'm proud to be an academic writer. And yes, I do write journalism, and I do write trade publications, but I am an academic writer, and I know what that means, and I write a lot. And we need to recognise that academic writing is different from the other modes of writing around us because we have to acknowledge the interplay of ideas from great scholars who came before us. We must acknowledge that. That is interpretation. That is research. So we don't do a vibe. <laughs> so in academic writing, we go, oh, I have an opinion. Do you? Do you? I have an opinion and I'm going to immediately overshare that. <laughs> that's not academic writing. If you have an opinion, that's great. That opinion doesn't have a great deal to do with academic writing. Because academic writing is textured. It's careful. It's scaffolded. And it recognises our legacy. And we perform that legacy to other scholars via our footnotes, our references, our bibliographies. We have a legacy. So therefore our writing is very different. It's an interplay between past and present, between self and society, but also between innovation and history. Put another way, you're writing an original contribution to knowledge. Great, that's what a PhD is. How do you know it is original if you don't understand the history of your discipline. Anyone could go, oh, look, I've invented that. It's like, dude, that was invented 15 years ago. Sort yourself out, right? And examiners will find that. If you go, I've done this and it's brand new, they'll go and they'll show, are you aware these 27 people came up with this idea in the last 20 years? So we must have that intellectual generosity and that interplay between the history of our disciplines and the innovation that we are enacting through research. If you like, we write in response. We write in response to the work of others. We're not ventriloquists. We're not just simply puppeting the words of the past. That's not what we're doing. Instead, we are acknowledging our research innovation by understanding the innovations on which it is built. So in, in many ways, when we're teaching academic writing, we're really teaching academic rewriting. The point of references, the very point of referencing, is to show transparency and respect. Acknowledging how other scholars have left their fingerprints on us. Referencing shows to our readers our journey through knowledge. And that, I think, is the great problem when we put all the energy and the focus, as it has been for the last 20 years, on plagiarism, academic misconduct and research misconduct. We rarely discuss how to rewrite with clarity, boldness and innovation. The whole point of academic writing is rewriting, engaging with the scholarship of brilliant people. So we take, this is what we do, we take an acceptable idea from our discipline, okay, that's sort of an acceptable truth, and we walk around with it for a while, give it a bit of a poke, give it a bit of a probe, and ask some difficult questions. So we reflect, we revise, 
and we rewrite. We use the writing of others to rewrite and rewrite with innovation. And that means when we say something new, it's grounded. When we say something new, it's dug in to the research of the great minds that came before us. And therefore, our interpretation of the work of others and your referencing actually is a confirmation of rigor and excellence. Now, I've already used rewriting quite a lot in this vlog already. When I use the word rewriting, for me, I use it to capture the social practice of writing, the social practice of writing. And too often, I reckon, we think of writing as the sort of individual act, a, a tortured person wrangling every last word out of their brain. And that's why I'm sort of doing this so early in the morning this morning. You know, this is usually my writing time when I'm recording this. And we sort of have this notion of sort of an early morning, someone tortured, just had a cup of coffee and just struggling to get the words out. Like you're pushing them out of your body like toothpaste out of a toothpaste container. That's not true, of course. That's not true. Writing always exists in a context. We write in a context, we write in a social environment. And that context is the marinade for what we do. So rewriting, if you will, recognises the collective nature of ideas generation and the collective nature of research. But further, and what I love about it is writing, rewriting, confirms that writing is an action. Writing is an act. We have an idea, that's great. We read around what other people have said about that idea. We move it around and then we render those ideas active when we write about them. So as you can see, writing is not a thing. It's not a vibe. It's a process, it's a practice, it's an act. Therefore, the word rewriting allows us to be reflexive about our context and how we approach the words of others. So this is where the attention to rewriting provides a great clarity about how we interpret the words of others. Now, let me be really clear here. Interpretation is a very difficult skill. Think, I mean, I'm however old I am, and I've never actually been taught how to interpret. It's assumed that we can interpret, but interpretation is a very difficult skill. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Because at the end of the day, anyone can offer an opinion. Any fool out there can say, oh, I've got a view. Have you? Have you? And why am I meant to care about that? So an opinion, not hugely interested. Academic work demands more of us. We have to represent the words of others in a way that is fair. So paraphrasing the words of others in a way that is reasonable. But the challenge is when you're looking at the work of others, what exactly do you emphasize in your interpretation? How do you avoid constructing a straw academic and a straw argument? Hard to do. Uh, it is challenging, and it's a great challenge for me, can I say. And there, there's because there's a lot of scholars that I read that I just go, wow, that's just dreadful. That's just, wow, that's just wrong. So what do you do when you read the scholar where you read it and you go, well, the methodology's wrong, the ontology's completely a mess, the research questions, what's going on here, and there's not enough reading. So, you know, what do you do? What do you do in those circumstances? And I often call this the Mark Prinsky effect. I have a lot of problems with Mark Prinsky. He's the guy that developed the phrase digital natives. So I think that guy basically destroyed 20 years of internet studies. So, so for me, you know, how do I respond to this person that I think is just absolutely wrong, okay? But you've, you've got to allow, and I've learned this through time, can I say, you've got to present the argument of that person on their own terms. You have to be fair and rewrite their ideas with clarity. Get that set first. What are they trying to do before you critique them? And that is the difference 
between opinion and interpretation. Make the argument, don't assume the argument. So what happens is we recognise a concept, an idea, an argument from a writer and we acknowledge it on its own terms. Then, as we move that concept, interpretation, idea to another project, our project, perhaps our PhD research, we move it, at that point we offer a critique. So through the movement of ideas, interpretation is created. There's no doubt that the digital environment has transformed our rewriting, not only because it's just so easy to cut and paste ideas and that's a problem, that's a real problem and that's why the plagiarism rates have increased. But what I think is the greater problem of the online environment in terms of writing is the speed at which we move ideas. The physical ability to move, it doesn't worry me too much, but the speed at which we do that has had an impact. Because my argument is that the speed of the movement of text truncates, reduces the time available for us to rewrite the ideas with fairness. Have a think, have a breath, and interpret the ideas of others with clarity and with innovation. So the internet, <laughs> the online environment, was not the end of Western civilization. <laughs> it didn't create a decline in thinking. It didn't. But the speed at which ideas move has created a decline in interpretive space. Put another way, digital literacy, the ability to use the online environment, is a very, very simple series of tasks. Very easy to do, you know, digital literacy, doing stuff, it isn't hard, not difficult. But I'm arguing through my career that digital literacy has not been accompanied by information literacy. So that means we've cut and paste, we've assumed that that's information literacy. Actually, information literacy is the capacity to weigh, to measure, to pause, to ponder and offer an interpretation. So in this way, as you can see, digital literacies can actually block the development of information literacies through the speed of the textual movement. So digitised text gives us great potentials for sampling, resampling, repurposing ideas, and that's great. But interpretive time is also required. Now, I can tell a great deal about an academic, I can tell a great deal about a writer by what they read. As you know, when I examine PhDs, I turn to the reference list, the bibliography, first. And I know where that thesis is going to go by the proxy of the bibliography reference list. I'm exactly the same when I'm reading refereed research every single day. I start with the reference list and I know what I'm going to get by what's in the list and also what's not in the reference list. And the question we all must ask as scholars is, what do we do when the reading ends? How do we select the mode of writing that is to emerge from our research? Now, rewriting <laughs> re can be absolutely dreadful. Think about it. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Think about it when someone tells a joke. You know when someone tells a joke and that horrible thing happens where people don't get the joke and they have to re-explain the joke? Well, that's sort of rewriting, isn't it? You sort of, the joke didn't work and so you're rewriting the joke and not only is it not funny, but it gets really embarrassing really quickly. So the key, therefore, is to balance the desire for accuracy and fairness with the movement to interpretation and analysis. That's the key. And that's why all writing is actually rewriting. And it's important to remember that no meaning is ever delivered naturally. Let me just state that again. No meaning is ever delivered naturally. So you don't simply plug an academic article into your brain, you download it and upload it. Okay, That's not how we engage with research. Everything, everything 
requires interpretation. And there is no simple, there is no obvious meaning. Because the moment we read that research, we make a startling discovery. The moment in which that research was written is different from the moment in which we are reading that research. And we have to understand what that gap means. Therefore, we have to mind the gap. The gap between the writing and the reading and the reading and the rewriting. So it's recognising context, the social practice of writing. My context is different from your context, absolutely. Therefore, how I make sense of a piece of research is very different from how you make sense of a piece of research. Because we make meaning and we summon interpretations in context. As readers, as writers, our job is to be fair. Our job is to be transparent, transparent and careful in presenting the work of others and demonstrating how we created our interpretation. That's the challenge. How did we do it? So when preparing for this vlog and thinking about how I create that interpretation and show I've created interpretations from work I often find is pretty dreadful, right? what do I do? I ask myself a series of questions to slow me down. So I've read something, go, gee, that's dreadful, gee, that's dreadful, but I need to use it in my work. So how do I slow myself down, take a breath, and be fair and transparent? And the answer is, I ask myself a series of questions. I have prompt questions. So these, these are how I handle my interpretation. Right, okay, take a breath. What is the researcher's key argument? What's their argument? What are they trying to do? Right. The next question is a tougher one. That's the argument. The next question is, what do they think they're doing? What do the researchers think they're doing? Write that down. Because what they think they're doing, in many cases, is not what they have done. But what do they think they are doing? Right. What is the point of the research? What's the outcome? What's the goal? What's the point of this research? Right. Next question, is there a major concept or idea that is delivered through the research? Okay, now they're the key questions. So that's looking at the research on its own terms, right? Take a breath, being fair. Then at this point we move into what are the strengths and the weaknesses of that research? And the next question moving into your interpretation, why was it written? And where was it written? So you've got the context of that research. Now, these questions allow you to move from reading to writing. Understanding the context in which the words were written and moving it to your context so you can use it. And that means you can, once you've done that, you can apply that reading to your own theories, your own data sets, and you'll be doing it with respect and you'll be doing it with care. Now I understand it is really tough <laughs> to be generous to the ideas of others. Our first instinct, particularly in a Twitter age, is to give an idea a good shake and go, you're a loser. Well, wow, that person's an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're a moron. What were you doing? That was, that was stupid. stupid. That's what our age encourages. That person, you're an idiot. But trolling is not thinking. Being a troll is not being a thinker. They're different. So therefore, it is important that we take a breath, we relax, we present ideas as fairly as possible. And then we move to the strengths and the weaknesses. The way to avoid this easy move into opinion and understand the difference between opinion and interpretation is to just take a breath and ask, what was the writer trying to achieve? When they got up in an early morning to start writing, what were they trying to do? Why was their argument offered at this time? And who was their audience for the research? Because the other argument could be the audience for their research 
is different from the audience for your research. So understand the different readerships. So with all these questions, they help you contextualize the research. So suddenly you're rewriting work of others with a purpose because you're configuring it in a way that it becomes mobile. You can move it into your research with decency. So if you will, academic writing is a conversation. And look, each discipline has a different conversation. Physicists speak differently to anthropologists. Trust me, they do. Mathematicians speak differently from English academics. Psychologists speak differently from business academics. The conversations are different. But academic writing is more than a conversation between a reader and a writer because academic writing exists for dissemination, to go to many readers. And citation is the strategy that we use to map your intellectual journey. So when we move ideas forward, we render them mobile through quotations or paraphrasing and references, we're actually allowing new readers to find these old ideas. How great is that? So someone's ready to go, oh, that's interesting. That's a very interesting idea. And they look at your reference and they're able to then find that scholar and read that scholar. That's the dialogue. Brilliant. So from this basis, this honest foundation, you can ask yourself, what do I bring to this discussion? What do you offer <laughs> that is new? What do you offer that's new? And if it helps you when I'm asking that question of myself, often in a very early morning like this, I think a great deal about cover songs. You know, the people that, the greatest songs of all time, and then they do a version of it. I'm, you know, I do a lot of work in popular music, and I'm pretty obsessed by cover songs. I do actually collect them. When I love a song, I get like 40 versions of it, right? So I'm one of those people. And so if we think about the greatest cover songs of all time, and I can talk about this for several years, but let's say Hendrix, All Along the Watchtower, let's say Pet Shop Boys, Always On My Mind, I will fight you in the car park if you don't like the Pet Shop Boys, Always On My Mind, just putting it out there, but there are many great covers. And what makes a great cover song? What creates a great cover? What do they do? Well, firstly, they acknowledge the original. The point of being a cover is you've got to hear the original in it. You've got to be recognised. So it becomes a foundation. It becomes a frame. And from that frame, from that foundation, the cover song then can create something new and spectacular through acknowledging the legacy. When we acknowledge the influence, we can summon our difference. From a very, very early morning, <laughs> I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.